School is in. But are you really ready to learn? Open your eyes to a new day in education with The Awakening Educator, a program specifically designed to explore a new mindful way of educating our youth. Learn about social-emotional learning, new modalities of teaching, and the most relevant topics in education with your hosts, Susan Andrian and Megan Sweet. Susan and Megan will take you inside the issues by looking at them from different points of view, from policies and research to teaching models that are actually used in schools. There's never a dull moment in this classroom. You can catch The Awakening Educator every other Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern on Spreaker, Facebook Live, WDJY 99.1 FM, WTTA 101.2, Talk 10 FM, and many other platforms. You can also watch it on our app anytime from anywhere in the world at uimediaapp.com. Have any questions you'd like to ask? Maybe you have knowledge you'd like to share. Call 678-495-4345 and share your thoughts live on air. Grab a pen and paper and get ready to open your textbooks and minds to a new way of learning on The Awakening Educator. Hi, everybody. Welcome to The Awakening Educator. I'm Susan. And I'm calling in from Atlanta today, or or on the show from Atlanta today. And Susan is in our studio in Oakland with um, our guest, Dr. Maceo Payne. Yes. We're super excited to be here, and I miss you, Megan. I'm glad to see you out there in Atlanta. I miss you, too. Um, Before we get started, we'll want to remind everybody that you can buy our Conscious Journal, Plan Your Day Intentionally with our Seeds of Intention Daily Conscious Planner. Visit www.unitedintentions.org to learn more. And we want to say hello to our friends at 991.1 FM, WDJY. And hello, friends, from WTTA 101.2 in Kentucky and Ohio. Yes, so we are super excited today to have our guest, Dr. Matteo Payne. I had the opportunity to work with Dr. Matteo uh, at Lincoln, and he's here to talk to us today about our uh, about Freedom School. So I'm going to read, let you know about oh, Dr. Matteo, and I'm pulling it up here. Uh, so Dr. Matteo Payne is a renowned educator, social worker, and activist. Matteo has over 20 years experience working with Oakland's children, youth, and families. And as a native, he has deep roots to the community. Uh, Matteo has extensive experience in diverse settings, but mm-hmm. today we're here to focus on Freedom Schools. Macheo was the driving force in bringing Freedom Schools, a children's defense fund summer program rooted in the Mississippi Freedom Summer Project of 1964 to Oakland. This six-week summer literacy and cultural enrichment program is designed to serve children and youth in grades K through 12 in communities where quality academic enrichment programming is limited. Uh, he first brought um, Freedom Schools is an executive, he was the executive director of Freedom Schools from 2012 to 2018. And since he first brought Freedom Schools to Oakland, hundreds of children in our city have benefited from this powerful program as evidenced by increased reading scores over the summer, a time when most children experience a slip in performance. Each Freedom Schools program provides culturally relevant summer literacy curriculum, which empowers scholars and youth by focusing on five essential components, high quality academic instruction, intergenerational impact, parent-family involvement, social action and civic engagement, and nutrition and health, right? So they get it up, most of it? it. You got it. Yes, so we're super excited to talk to Mateo today to hear about uh, Freedom Schools and the work that you've been doing. And I'm curious, so I'm going to just jump right in to some of the, maybe you can tell us about where Freedom Schools started and how it was rooted. Sure, so Freedom Schools really goes back to the 1800s, but we, we won't we won't go <laughs> through the whole thing, but it really started in 1964 with the Freedom Summer in Mississippi, and Mary Wright Edelman started the Children's Defense Fund in 73 and brought a bunch of leaders at the time together to talk about the plight of Black children in America in 1991, I believe, and they came out with the assessment that Black children were facing the worst crisis since slavery because of the violence, health, and education outcomes that they were facing, as well as the structural 
um, breakdown that was happening in the 90s for Black families. So the Freedom School started in 93 through five cities, uh, through the Children's Defense Fund. Oakland was one of the first cities. Oakland was one of the first cities. Yes. I became involved two years later. And so, mm-hmm. although I didn't bring it to Oakland, once I got involved, I stayed involved. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I never left. And so the Oakland Freedom Schools is a very, very unique program that not only connects to the civil rights history and foundation mm-hmm. of literacy and um, civic participation, but Oakland Freedom Schools also integrates the radical movements of the 60s and 70s for Black power mm-hmm. and, and liberation. So Freedom Schools is a mix of all of that. Awesome. So when you got involved, one of the things that I, uh, I want to get to, and, and maybe Megan, you can jump in at, at any point as well, is really think <laughs> about like how, um, what were some of the most important components that make Freedom Schools successful? Or, uh, right. So, so Freedom Schools is unapologetically Black. Uh, in terms of its focus of curriculum, its books. And what's interesting is any program that's designed right for the brain and for the culture Mm -hmm. of of children is is good for all children. So it's it's not exclusive for Black families, but Mm -hmm. uh, it definitely is an environment that allows Black children to connect with their identity while learning, which is Mm -hmm. different when you think about it, Mm -hmm. for African-American children. And it's actually also good for Latino children Mm -hmm. or white children or any children to also experience that amongst Black students in that program. So I think identity and the focus for African-American is is key. And the focus of the books and the curriculum and the Mm -hmm. themes really highlight what's good about America, right? Highlighting the civil rights, highlighting some of the heroes, highlighting some of the positive things that go back in African-American history into the 1920s, 10s. And so the books will highlight different authors and really, you know, bring to life not only the civil rights, but the Harlem Renaissance and many things that are left out of traditional schools. Yeah, Yeah, that's really exciting. I'm a a former history teacher, so I I love bringing the history and especially um, positive and empowering pieces of our history because we often tend to go to the the parts that are um, the most painful and then we create a narrative that way as well. So I really appreciate right. that lens there. What's the, the first difference you see in kids as they show up in freedom school? You know, they're showing up at summer school probably in their minds as a starting point and then it's different. And I'm just wondering, you know, like what's that first shift that you start to see or how do you start to set the tone from the beginning? Right. And so Freedom Schools really is about creating scholars. Susan mentioned scholar in the intro, and that's what we call our young people. We don't call them students. We call them scholars. And so it's about the identity of scholarship, the identity of knowing your history, the identity of pride. And so with the Freedom Schools program, what you will see is children who on day one embody the identity of a typical black child in a school that disenfranchises their existence, their identity, Mm -hmm. and makes them feel uncomfortable. It makes them feel um, other than, and uh, someone who is prone to misbehave. And Mm -hmm. so when you see them sort of coming in with that, basically that identity or that defense, because this is, this freedom schools operates on schools. We, 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 we use schools to operate. So they come in sort of feel like this is, kind of going to be the same thing. And we start with Harambe time where the children are engaged, the adults let down their their armor and really dance and sing and really get the children active and engaged. You see the shift when young people feel um, like they can bring their self to this program. And secondarily, when they feel safe. And mm-hmm. safe safety is something that emotionally is a process. And so with the Harambe time, that's where we see it. We see it from the very beginning, the first day, Harambe time. We're asking them to clap, sing, follow instructions, and we're asking the adults to do it right along with them. So if you're an adult, you got to be silly, you got to be corny, and you've got to have this high energy at 8.30 yeah. in the morning in your, on your summer. And so that's the push that we feel like is the special sauce to engage these young people, not first as this is the rule, this is your role, but welcome. This is mm-hmm. a community, we're a family, 
let's let's get excited about this. Yeah, that's I, wonderful. Oh, sorry. Can I just for some oh, some folks might not know what Harambe time is. You described it a little bit. Could but could you describe a little bit more what that means sure. and and how that would be different from a start of a day normally? Sure. So Freedom Schools has a lot of components that are very structured. Um, and we can get into that. So Harambe is the first component after they eat breakfast. We serve uh, 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 hot meals, breakfast, lunch, and snack. And Harambe is a way to get the young people involved. It's key Swahili for pull together. So hmm. the Harambe time has cheers, chants. We have games. We have, it's basically opportunities for uh, young people to also lead, lead cheers and chants. Um, we have acknowledgments, recognition, we have a, a theme song, and it's really a time where it's intergenerational. The parents who are dropping off their kids are always welcome to come and participate in the Harambe time. Uh, you have little brothers and sisters also there at Harambe time. So just off the bat, it's structured differently, and you also have a scenario where the young people are being animated. You know, these are children. We're human beings. When we wake up, you know, as adults, we, we, we need our coffee, right? And the children, mm -hmm. they need to scream, shout, run, play, talk, um, smile, laugh, giggle. They need yeah. to do all of that in, in, in a way that's structured and fun and engaging and actually builds them up. So Harambe time is very critical. It's a half hour. And, oh, wow. and they, they leave Harambe time and go directly into the classroom for three hours. So Harambe mm -hmm. time is very, very important to get them enthusiastic about going in and learning. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, um, you'd mentioned the adults and training and making sure the adults are involved. Yes. And I, I remember when we were at Lincoln and, and when they were in the training process that you put through the, the adults through a lot of the same experiences. Yes. So how is that a critical piece where I, I remember seeing the adults out there cheering and singing and dancing as they were learning how to bring this to the kids. Is yes. that a consistent part of That is part of the model. So Freedom Schools is an internship model. So mm -hmm. the staff that we hire to do this program uh, are interns. So this may be their very first time working with children. Usually mm -hmm. we screen for folks that have some experience, but the training is designed there. So it's a six week program, but we have a two week training. Mm -hmm. Right. So think about that. 20 percent of the time that they're doing this internship, they're being trained mm -hmm. to do it first. Mm -hmm. And the training is two weeks. Uh, there's a training in Tennessee uh, that where they train all the first year, second year interns nationally. Uh, and so you go to uh, week long training in Tennessee. Then you come home to your local city and then there's a week long of training. So that's part of the design and the model. And so we actually do Harambe every day in the training. It's not like, yeah. you know, teacher training, you yeah. right, you're teachers, and then you go into some back room and you do the worst level of, uh, you know, information <laughs> and learning for the principals, right? Um, yeah. So what we do is we have Harambe in staff, and we have Deer Time, and we have um, different staff present and do activities with the adults because it's all about rehearsal it's all about training and it's all about support so that's the intergenerational feature of freedom schools is hiring college age young adults and giving them that training to hopefully um lead them into the teaching profession which a lot of them end up doing yeah it's wow, really exciting of your book megan around like sort of the insight and it's like taking all of those pieces and putting it where there's so much training around it but how that fits into the model, like some of the components. Oh, thank you, Susan. Yeah, I think just the idea of building community together, especially for, for new people entering into education, it's exciting to hear this idea that you're training and learning together and that that's taken so seriously, especially when with summer school normally. It's often people that are just kind of like slotted in. There are definitely people who like doing summer school, but it's not always a very intentional space for kids. Um, so that it sounds like you really create an intentional space, starting with uh, the experience for the adults, which is really powerful. When we come back from break, we'd love to talk a little bit more about, um, I'd love to a little bit know a little bit more about how you bring the parents in. That's a really crucial piece of the puzzle. So it'd be really cool to hear about that when we come back from break. But we'll go on break now.
Good day, planet Earth. Michael Don Miguel Litton here in Roswell, GA. Join me every other Friday at 6 p.m. for the Ride the Vibe Show, the show where creative folks have the opportunity to share the genesis and power of their creativity, where they can intend having their talent being expressed all over the planet. Find my show on WDJY 99.1 FM on the United Intentions Spreaker Channel, iTunes, Stitcher, and many more. You can also find my show on social media on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram as United Intentions and on Twitter at Higher Intention. Jump on the wave and ride the vibe. It's a cool way for getting the creative juices flowing. Cheers to a groovy day. And remember to always ride the vibe. Welcome back to the Wicked Educator. Sorry. <laughs> Susan and I are normally together, and I'm looking at you and waiting for you to talk. Sorry, Susan. I'll, I'll, I'll welcome us back. So welcome back to the Awakening Educator. We're with Dr. Mateo Payne. Hi. Welcome back, Mateo. Thank you. I also want to welcome our friends in Atlanta on Talk 10 FM. Uh, welcome now. You can now watch and listen to all of our shows live and on our new smart app. Download it at, at uimediaapp.com. And if you have any questions, you can talk with us live. You can call us at 678-495-4345. We would love to answer any questions or have a conversation with you uh, if you have something for Dr. Mateo Payne and Freedom Schools. Yep, and you can connect with us online as well. So you can follow us on social media on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube as United Intentions and Higher Intentions on Twitter. You can follow the United, uh, the Awakening Educator on um, Facebook and uh, and, and on um, Instagram as well. So welcome back. Thank, Thank you, you, Mateo. Um, so Megan, you had a question for Mateo when we were going out. Yeah, one of the five components of, of Freedom Schools is intergenerational impact. And you named a little bit about how you welcome parents in when they drop off their children. But I'm just wondering what the, you know, what other pieces of the parent involvement um, you bring into your program. Right. So parents are engaged early on. First, Freedom Schools is a free program. We ask for very nominal um, uh, fees um, for, for parents that can pay. But in general, it's a program that is to be made available to families that don't normally have something for their children to do during the summer. And <clears throat> so we have an orientation and we have, but and we have parents engage with the program on a very high level. They all have to come to a parent orientation. And at the orientation, we tell them all about the program. And throughout the six week program, we have weekly parent engagement workshops. And so at those workshops, we have uh, different experts from Lincoln or from the community that we're connected to, to facilitate conversations with the parents around discipline, behavior, helping your children study, mm -hmm. um, uh, integrating health in your children's mm -hmm. lunches and their meals. And so we, and, and we also organically create spaces for the parents to talk about whatever challenges they're having with their kids. And it really bonds the parents mm -hmm. at these parent workshops. And of course they're participants in um, chaperones or field trips and they bring snacks and there's a deer day. So there's also events uh, every week that are either fun field trips or uh, site-based Juneteenth festivals. And we're always engaging parents to participate at whatever level they're able to participate. Mm -hmm. I'm curious because I know um, at, when, and Lincoln is Lincoln Family Services. Mateo and I had our tenure there. And over that time that we were there, the, the focus of the agency really shifted from a sort of intensive individual therapy model to more and more community-based, which Freedom Schools is part of. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering how, uh, if you believe that more, there's more parent engagement from usually disenfranchised parents that don't show up to those things at Freedom Schools and, and what, how, why? Okay, like, so um, a really important distinction for Freedom Schools and the other uh, programs that you would access at Lincoln is it's a program that I would send my children to. And so mm -hmm. when we're dealing with very sensitive services that are targeted for individuals, 
it's it's usually a shaming a, sh a shameful experience for the parent right mm -hmm. your child is is truant right um mm -hmm. well they were sick we had you know and so when we engage the parents it's it's without any shame because it's a program that uh is not for troubled kids right mm -hmm. it's not for bad kids it's not for poor kids it's for beautiful engaging black children and so we speak to the parents in a way that these may be the same families and children that are in some of our more mm -hmm. intensive programs but the way we recruit the way we advertise the way the program is geared towards community um and and healing and growing and building as a community uh i think is how african-american parents in particular respond better yeah that's a really, I really appreciate um, so many things of what you just said, especially this idea, <clears throat> although you didn't label it this way, but of being assets-based and assuming this level of uh, connection and engagement with your students and the wholeness of students that we often don't see in schools. And a lot of the parents that I've worked with, especially from disenfranchised communities, don't feel like they have the permission to step forward or be a part of school because those interactions do generally start with some kind of your kids doing something wrong, they're behind or something like that. Um, right. <clears throat> and generally they didn't have a positive experience in school themselves. So it's this, this multi-generational issue around feeling welcomed and supported at schools. Um, exactly. So I really appreciate that. Um, I was wondering, you know, it's a really powerful program. Are there elements of it that you feel like could be translated to the regular school day and what would those be? Right, and so the the saddest experience I I experience every year is parents coming up to me, begging me to make it a year round school. And Freedom Schools has a reading curriculum. We don't have a science curriculum. We don't have well. There's a history component to the books, but in general, I think that well, what we've done is we've actually brought the Harambe model to some mm -hmm. uh, classrooms, uh, special ed classrooms in Oakland Unified. And I think training, we provide, I've provided a training to special ed teachers on Harambe time. So I think Harambe time is an excellent component that all schools could use. Mm -hmm. I, I've been a part of schools that have had morning ritual, morning circle, and there's a lot of different ways to do it. A lot of times it's boring and it doesn't involve the kids and it's not, it's not involving movement not and song and dance. And we don't want to stereotype uh, black communities or communities of color, but movement and dance and music helps. <laughs> it yes. helps people move through their feelings and move through their emotions, uh, especially if you have uplifting songs and inspiring songs. And so I, I'd go so far as to say, I think it helps all, you know, I mean, I think all of us learn in very physical kinesthetic ways. And then our, their, the brain research now is coming out supporting right. a lot of the practices that, that have been traditionally in communities of color around movement and singing and voice. And right. so just, really recognizing it. So I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in addition to the Harambe time, I think that the um, the way Freedom Schools has been designed was was literally a common core focus. So it was about Bloom's taxonomy and moving children mm -hmm. up the pyramid of comprehension and understanding for the, the literature. And lo and behold, you know, <laughs> as a common core standard start, you know, um, coming into the standard educational environment, it aligned perfectly. So there's a lot of crosswalk for freedom schools that I would encourage charter schools or public schools or any schools that have some flexibility in how they structure their day and how they deliver the curriculum and how they train their teachers. There's a lot in the model that can translate to regular schools. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd, I'd love to hear some of the uh, some of the numbers, and I don't have them off the top of my head, but there's right. some incredible data around, uh, and I mentioned it slightly in the in, in the intro of of how much kids um, grow over the summer, and what are some of those numbers, and why do you think they grow so many reading levels? It's, it's in such a short period of time. Right, and so it's two years increase in reading level um, for. Mm -hmm the three freedom school sites mm -hmm. five to 14 year olds and for the sweeney camp sweeney site these were kids in jail 15 to 19 and for the sweeney i'll talk about the sweeney freedom schools they read five novels mm. in six weeks wow they read them in class together they read them out loud uh they read them every day they have conversations about the books 
And so at Camp Sweeney, you have more Latinos than mm -hmm. African Americans incarcerated this past year, first there, year. There are ever. more Latinos and, incarcerated in, in la, at last year's, uh -huh. right? And so the curriculum adjusts. So one of the books is La Linea. So it's a book mm -hmm. about immigration. It's a book about um, coming to this country and, and, and as children and and all of the crap they have to go through. And mm -hmm. so because they're reading every day, because they're reading out loud, because they're reading about books that relate and they're having discussions about the books that relate to their mm -hmm. lives, that relate to their relatives, that relate to their community and what's happening. Uh, I think all of that adds to basically having a intensive six weeks where adults believe in them and, and, and give them multiple opportunities to mess up while they're reading mm -hmm. uh, builds their confidence in reading. And so what we found out with the Sweeney was we had a higher gain in reading level for the older kids which flies in the face of what we always try to wow. say. You got to get younger, 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 younger. Oh, there is, once they're 16, 17, you know, it's, and these were kids in jail. Right. So I can't emphasize that enough that uh, when you provide the opportunity for the children, whether they're middle class, seven year olds, yep. or they're incarcerated for robbery at 18 years old, they will respond when it's, connects them to their identity and their culture. And now the difference is if you're in a regular school environment and you're learning about everything and you're hearing nothing about your identity or your culture and any references to your family and your community are negative. Right. Mm. Right. And so I think yeah. that's the main difference around how we get them into the material and how they actually increase their skills. So you, so you said across the board, the average for the summer reading, the summer programs in Oakland is two years. Yes. We've, six weeks? we've been measuring it for the past seven years through the children's defense fund. And the national average is one, one year gain in reading level across because they're doing, they're doing, we're doing pre and post measuring, mm -hmm. uh, at over a hundred sites across the, the country. And I tell you, Susan, I've even had people um, question the outcomes. It's yeah. sad. <laughs> yeah. It's real. It's like, it's like yeah. stand and deliver, you right. know, where these kids, yeah. you know, they, they did something phenomenal and it was so out of the box for the, of the funding streams and all the institutions where they're headed. They just didn't believe it. Wow. Right. And that, that's part of what we're up against in freedom schools in the first place, which is why we exist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I mean, as a as somebody who used to teach English in in a middle school level, um, I just want to underscore how profound that is because you get kids, especially as they're older, coming in at a wide range of reading levels, right? So you can have kids that are, you know, middle school and above that are still at second grade reading level, third grade reading level, all the way up to close close to being at their age appropriate grade level. But to teach that a wide range in one room is always very difficult. So it's really interesting to hear. Um, what your model is, which it sounds like reading out loud, having discussions so students understand the content, and because it's culturally relevant and uh, and connects to to who they are, it also encourages kids to be able to to read and to take some of those risks of reading when it's hard um, and becomes a big motivator. Is that about right? Yes, and thank you for um, lifting that up because that's a key piece of our model that also flies in the face of what 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 a lot of uh, resource parents worry about, which yeah. is, hey, my kid is already reading at the fourth grade level. Why are you putting in, him in this level one? Well, because it's his age group. And so what we found at Freedom Schools is you're not going to mess up the higher performing readers. Mm -hmm. You're not going to mess them up. Right. They're going to help the other kids read. I mean, this isn't new, right? Mm -hmm. And so, but that's always a concern. It's like, oh, this is a reading program. My kid's not struggling with reading. Or I've had parents say, well, my kid struggles with reading. I don't want to cause more anxiety and put them in that program. So as parents, we kind of hold the issues. But when you really give them um, the space and time, then that's what works. So, so it's, the fe it's the fear and using relationship, using culture, using all of those things that we know work to overcome those fears and anxiety, create an environment where kids can really thrive and feel good about who they are, feel connected to their community. And, 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 and we, we un, unashamed use love. We use lots mm -hmm. of love. We love on mm -hmm. our interns. We love on the program. We love on the model because we love the outcomes. Yeah. Megan and I are huge proponents of love. We got to get it together, right? Yeah. Uh, that's know, that's so the thing. Um, <laughs> and we love our UI. Cause, right? I mean, United Intense, we're going to a break. Is that right, Megan? 
Yes, we're going to go to a break. Um, thank you for that. That's a really inspiring uh, place to end for our, our break. When we come back, it would be great to hear a little bit more about um, Freedom Schools and how maybe it connects with the other schools across the country and, and how people can get involved and then also a little bit more about you and, and what you're up to. So we'll be back in a bit. Are you ready to be the hero of your own story? It's time to put the power of your health back into your hands. Join us for our free 25-day journey to get your life back now from chronic illness. Our doctors and experts will guide you back to optimal health. Hi, everybody. My name is Kelly Gallagher. I'm a five-time cancer survivor powered by my six pacemaker and a new heart valve. How did I get well? I have the most amazing, incredible, integrative, alternative, complementary, adjunct, and functional medicine doctors that you could ever imagine. And they're all at getyourlifebacknow.live. Two days, 16 doctors, news you can use. They have all the solutions of how you can take power and charge of your own personal health care. The best thing that we can all do is to learn how to take care of ourselves. Go to www.getyourlifebacknow.live and begin your journey today. Hi, welcome back to The Awakening Educator. I'm Susan and we're here with Megan. You there? Yep, I'm here. Hello, everybody from Atlanta. And we're here with Dr. Mateo Payne. Uh, and before we talk some more with Dr. Mateo, I would like to, um, you can tune in later at six for Ride the Vibe, where musical guests will be a trumpeter and a singer, Joe Granston. And you can make sure you listen to the Good Intentions show this Monday at 11 a.m. when Tim Ray will be interviewing chiropractor, speaker, and best-selling author, Dr. Carol Soloway, right here on the United Nations Intentions Network. Blah. And save the date for July 20th, where at the Gate City Brewing Company in Roswell for the Awakening Atlanta, the Awaken Atlanta celebration party. Join us for fun, good times, and go on UI Media Celebration Party on Facebook and respond. And welcome back, Dr. Mateo Payne. Um, I want to hear a little bit more about um, social action and civic engagement. In our last um, series on history, we spoke a lot about civic engagement and civic awareness and why it's important for children, especially with all that's going on in the world today. So I'd, I'd love to hear a little bit more about what that looks like and what the special Oakland spin is and how it connects to maybe the larger Freedom Schools initiatives. Absolutely. So... The immigration issue was a highlight focus last year, voter registration, Trayvon Martin. So going back year after year, every year, the children kind of pick whatever issue, social issue that's happening through facilitated discussions with the adults, with the uh, interns. And the young people, there's a nationally coordinated social action project that Children's Defense Fund picks a topic and we all... Um, uh, participate. And over the years, there's also been a leeway for individual sites to also mm. have their own focus. And so we've, we've done things going back 20 years uh, with Freedom Schools in Oakland, going to the mayor's office mm. to talk to the mayor, uh, civic, like direct um, civic engagement. They sometimes do projects where they visit black businesses, right, mm. throughout downtown Oakland. And so it can be a local community social action, or it can relate to a larger national or even global uh, social action. But it's really around the social awareness of our young people and the old adage, right, think globally, act locally. Mm. And how do you connect in um, Oakland's uh, deep history with the Black Panthers and other um, social uh, justice initiatives here? Like what makes Oakland special from, from the, or unique from the rest well, of the... Well, we have access to, to a, a lot of Black Panthers <laughs> that come and participate <laughs> and support, you know, Tarika Lewis, uh, who is a very active member of the community still today and was the first woman uh, in the Black Panther Party. We have uh, a legacy and a history. We actually have teachers that taught in the mm -hmm. Oakland Freedom School that were students 
in the Black Panther community schools mm. in the 70s. And so we have a uh, direct lineage and involvement of young adults that, and so what we do is we have guest speakers and we, we integrate it into our curriculum as well. But yeah, we're still, you know, there's a lot of folks that are still around that come and speak to the young people around that. Hmm. You, you said before you're un- unapologetically, I forget exactly, black. unapologetically black. And wondering how how that is experienced and wh- where there are barriers or where that really resonates for folks in the place that that that's often uh, well, hard to find. Can we can we speak some truth here <laughs> yeah, for a minute? Please so do. in the foundation and educational landscape of Oakland in the Bay Area. You have a lot of foundations, a lot of focus, a lot of money, a lot of people, a lot of smart people um, doing a lot of great things. Uh, Freedom schools were connected to a lot of those efforts. Mm -hmm. And without naming names, it it appears to be a a situation where it's such a huge issue for the schools and it's a national issue. It's almost a disbelief that Black people could actually figure it out on their own and so, mm. and, 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 because, and, and, and that's my interpretation, honestly, because of the level of support, right? If it was right. reversed, there would be this level of attention yes. that, that would be overwhelming. Absolutely. But, you know, I mean, I know you, but I, we, we don't have that type of attention. We don't have that type of overwhelming attention, like, oh my God, we've got to make this work everywhere right. else. And so we've just been quietly doing what we do. Uh, but I think it is a integral reason why Freedom Schools does not get the notoriety that the outcomes would warrant Mm -hmm. is because it's Black led. Mm -hmm. And it kind of flies in the face of folks who hold millions of dollars and are, you know, trying to do something that they think is uh, more direct or smarter or, you know, Mm -hmm. but Ultimately, Susan, when you when you when you go into communities and you find out what works, a lot of times it's a lot that's been working. It just hasn't gotten the attention of the systems that really can, you know, make it everywhere. Right. The systemic, the systemic stuff is deep, and I think when you even link into the insight part of of the work that you do around that work that implicit but and you brought it to us at lincoln as well Mm -hmm. around uh as a as a white woman doing this work for a really long time the critical piece around doing that work around what it means to to do that and when is it time for me to step back and just be an an ally right Right. And, and, and all efforts, I support all efforts, but uh, particularly if it's a black led effort that it could be supported Mm -hmm. and not say, Oh, well, I'm not centrally involved. So I don't think there's really a place for me. No, that's not, that's not really how it works. Right. Mm -hmm. (laughs) We, we all contribute in different ways to multiple efforts. So. Yeah. Yeah. How do you think we can start to change that? So beyond, you know, because I think implicit bias affects, um, obviously, the culture of power um, is walking around with a lot of implicit bias that we're not aware of. But um, how do we start to disrupt that so we can start to shift our narrative and our focus a little bit more, especially in service of children? Yeah, that is an excellent question. And um, I don't have the answer. <laughs> but one of the things I one of the things I, I, I always play around with the idea and exploration is for California at least, um, when you had an increase in students of color and a decrease in white students, you have a corresponding decrease in funding mm-hmm. <laughs> and increase in, in challenges. Uh and so I I think what has to happen is we have to um really have a Multi- intergenerational approach that really allows the young people today to step into youth leadership. I strongly believe in youth leadership and the youth know, um, they know what they want. They know what works for them. And we have to support our young leaders so that when they get in the positions of power in education, they can make the changes that are necessary. I don't think the current generation of adults really is equipped to make the changes necessary Mm -hmm. uh, with racial bias and um, with all of the things we're challenging. You know, you you got men struggling with uh, male privilege. You have Mm -hmm. white folks struggling with white privilege. And we're, we're still kind of in the thick of it. And I think we have to get to a place where 
um, uh, homophobia and, and things like that is just not really socially acceptable anymore. And, you know, mm -hmm. once we get to that place, I think our educational system will be fine. But as long as there's the deep seated racism, uh, we're going to see the educational system default to serving that majority. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately. Well, and it's exciting to hear that you, you part of the work that you do is to encourage um, the folks that work at Freedom Schools to become teachers later, because I think it is, Absolutely. that's the beginning part. There's plenty of research that shows, and it's also, I would say, an intuitive understanding that when there are students have in the classroom with teachers that look like them, they tend to do better because their culture is represented, because they feel seen, they feel supported in a different way. Um, than the dramatic um, imbalance there is in education in particular that is primarily white, primarily female um, educators yeah. um, with children that are increasingly not white and, um, and, and have these diverse backgrounds that aren't being represented in the classroom. So I'm wondering how, you know, like, do you have any stats or information on how many of your interns eventually become teachers and where they're being placed or are you guys monitoring that for Freedom Schools? We're not, um, it's a six week program and there's so <laughs> many components. Yeah. That, that we, <laughs> yeah. But that is something that we, we, we wish we could track, but I can say anecdotally that the adults I, I'm still connected to over the past 20 years that have gone into teaching, uh, I'm connected to a lot of folks on, on the East Coast that have, uh, be, so many principals, uh, superintendents, mm -hmm. district executives, from here to DC, to Minnesota, to Detroit, uh, freedom school leaders, servant leaders um, occupy these positions of power. And the, the thing that I can say about them is it's with freedom schools, it's not just about teaching or about schools. It's about transforming your community. Mm. And it's, it's, it's a movement. You know, when I sat in Urban Strategies Council as an intern, my very first year as a freedom school intern, right there in downtown Oakland, and Greg Hodge was the director and, you know, we had the whole intro and he said, uh, if you came here, you know, thinking this was a job, you're in the wrong place. This is a movement. Mm -hmm. And I had never heard anything like that. Right. Cause I thought it was a job. I looked around like, did you know this was a movement? I didn't know this was a movement. And, and it's infectious. And you yeah. go to Tennessee and they say, you got to go to this training at the at Alex Haley farm. And I'm thinking farm. And I'm picturing this big red barn. And if you go there, and it's the most beautiful uh, place. So, so if I had, if I had my, you know, my wish, we would really create a retreat center somewhere in Napa, somewhere in California, mm -hmm. and we would have a national training uh, and retreat center for California for Freedom Schools, mm -hmm. and it would also be a place where we could do. Uh, uh, training for staff as well as retreats for some of the young people and leadership because that's what worked for me that's what works right. for Oakland Freedom Schools so you ask me I'm gonna say well let's continue to do that and mm -hmm. propagate more leaders mm -hmm. so that and 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 create a process of creating those leaders that are committed to the changes in society not to specific career tracks right. that's the that. big difference you know mm -hmm. you're in school to get your doctorate and you, you you're being taught how to see, analyze, and solve major problems in society, and then you go to uh, the reception, and they're just trying to give you a job, mm. right? Mm. Right? And they're saying, well, where do you want to work? Well, we, you know, and, and it's like, well, how does that relate to this problem we're supposed to be solving, mm. right? Um, so that's what, that's what I think is, is really special about Freedom Schools, is it commits people to the movement wherever they can find it. Right. Yeah, because I, I mean, I know Freedom Schools has your career has been pretty big. You know, Freedom Schools has been a part of it, but right. but what I've known when we were working together is that even when you weren't doing Freedom Schools, Freedom Schools was a part of what you were doing. Right. And wondering how how you, we only have another minute or so, so I I just wanted to give you an opportunity to kind of talk about what are the other and this is like one piece mm -hmm. of your work mm -hmm. and it influences everything. But is there right. something that you want to share around sort? Of, your, the movement and who you are in this work and right. each of the different places that you go as a soldier. So I bring Freedom Schools everywhere I go. And I just want to highlight that it's just one organization. You have Flourish Agenda, you have Black Organizing Project, and you have other organizations that have been created since Freedom Schools. And it really creates a nice mm -hmm. constellation of organizations that are approaching this from different angles, but have a common goal. 
Dr. Payne, it's been so wonderful to speak to you, and I love this last ending point on, on creating a movement rather than just centering it on one specific career path. That's a really powerful place to, to, to contemplate, and also the partnerships that can build out of that. So it's not one organization, but it's a, a, multi, it's a group of, of different organizations working together. It's been such an incredible pleasure to have you on the show. So thank, thank you for joining you. us, and uh, we'll be back after the break. Download the UI Media Smart App at uimediaapp.com to watch and listen to all your favorite shows anytime from anywhere in the world. Shows that enrich, entertain, educate, and feeds the conscious cells throughout your body. We bring you never heard before topics in health, inspiration, music, psychics, numerology, current affairs, controversies, and much, much more. So what are you waiting for? Visit www.uimediaapp.com and start raising your frequency now. Welcome back to The Awakening Educator. This is Megan Sweet. And I'm Susan Andrian. Susan. And I'm going to move over a little bit because we said goodbye to Dr. Mateo Payne. Don't move, and don't so move. Um, so thank you for um, bringing Mateo on, Susan. That was a really powerful and, um, yeah, I'm, I'm feeling really inspired right now after talking with him. Just his energies and, and enthusiasm was like, yeah, it was, it was deep. It was deep. He is, he's a deep, he's a deep dude. And I feel really grateful of worked with them and, and to see what freedom schools really is about. Like it was, it, it wasn't a program that I was directly involved in, but you could see that, that, that his infectious joy really played throughout all of freedom schools. Um, and he's right. I, it was hard to believe those numbers. Yeah. Well, and just what that means about, yeah, our bias in this country and, mm -hmm. and how we, we can't recognize sometimes the, the gifts that are right in front of us. Um, yeah, there's so much that uh, I'm taking away. The, that last segment on, on creating a movement really, really struck a chord with me because I think that's what it's going to take to to change society. We put a lot of pressure on schools, and I do too. I mean, I was kind of automatically doing it. And then when he was naming, like, well, it's not just a career path. It's just a way of being, and it's a way of interacting, and there's all these different places where we work together. Um that was a profound, like, just even shift in my own mind of like, right, it's it's not just in in a career, but it's how we move through our days and through our life. And um, there's a lot of ways to have impact. So, yeah, yeah. The other uh, piece of what he was talking about it um, that was really important was a, for me was around uh, you know being unapologetically black and the role of allies in that work right and so how how important that is as as women white women that we're doing this work we've, we've been doing this work for a really long time for you know combined we don't have to say how long necessarily but <laughs> um, <laughs> but how, how do we continue to make sure that we're reflecting on that piece of uh, when is it time to step back and be uh, and, and and let something that's really working work and then what's my role and how do I show up for that? You know, that's a really powerful, that's a powerful thing to think about is I think often when we're allies, we want to step in everywhere and show that we're allies and, and being supportive. But sometimes the way we can be an ally is by stepping out um, and supporting in different ways, but not just trying to become, um, yeah, using our, using our, um, our privilege to create space for others rather than being directly involved is also another way of doing that and, and privileging other voices um, through ours um, is a way to do that too. So I appreciate you naming that. Um, yeah. And I know it's our like summer or anything goes series and, but it felt very linked to all of our other shows, right? Like I could, I could hear Larry's interviewing it. I could see how Nicola and the work that she's doing is really connected to it. And you could see, right, like all of these pieces that, that we have felt connected to Freedom Schools. 
too. Yeah, the idea of civic engagement and student empowerment and, and raising student voice, individual voice as well. You know, I think Larry talked about helping teachers to identify what their, you know, to navigate those dilemmas and how to, you know, use their experience and their perspective to figure out how to raise um the issues that they think are important for their kids to learn. And then we talked a lot about different ways that civic engagement is absolutely crucial um, through all of our, the rest of our interviews. Um, and yeah. it's, it's so true for today. Um, yeah, I, I think about my work clinically over the years and that civic engagement piece as a, as a clinician, how important the idea of having social agency in the world outside of yourself is actually a really important and healing healing part and I think it's missing from our schools uh, often right yeah. that, that feeling like I have something to give to the world or I have something to I have agency or yeah well and, and that was something that Macheo named right when we started that I really loved um, which is this idea of helping people understand what their agency is and empowering that voice and helping kind of kindle that um, in people so that they feel like they can do something and uh, I know in a little bit we're going to talk about some of some of the ways we want to do that, but that it can it's easy to feel powerless um, and that the system is so big and so overwhelming. And especially if um, you're part of a community that that doesn't get a lot of voice, doesn't get appropriate um, support or recognition, it's even harder, I would imagine, to feel like you have some agency. So I just love that that notion that there's, there's so many different ways that we can engage and start to feel empowered. So, yeah. So thank you so much for, for bringing, yeah. bringing Mateo on. It was great. Yeah. Thank you. And now we're going to, we're going to shift a, a little bit, right. To, to talk about some of the work that you're doing um, because I, and I think it's also really related to all of the different guests that we've had is we want to make sure that we're, that, that our audience gets to hear about some of the incredible things that you're trying to move forward and the work that you're doing with your three eyes and, and other components. So the first question I have is what's happening with your three eyes right now? Like what yeah. are some of the things that are really new for, for that are going on for you or exciting that are going on for you? Yeah. Thanks, Susan. Um, you know, the, we, I wrote the book and it's out in the world. And actually this week I got a chance to talk about it a lot. I was leading a, uh, helping to lead a retreat, um, for educators that are learning mindfulness and the three eyes, the, the third eye is intuition, which is a lot about mindfulness, but mindfulness is also kind of a, a precondition <laughs> or a, a supportive element we'll say, um, for our lives in general. But it's the idea with the three eyes that you need to learn to, to look at your life through these three different perspectives, um, uh, intellect, uh, which is, you know, the brain stuff, uh, insight, which is really emotional awareness and, um, perspective taking, being able to kind of step back and see your lives and your actions from a different point of view. And then intuition, uh, which is really using mindfulness to aid in those other two elements, but also um, learning how to get out of your head and into your heart a little bit more and will be a little bit more um, grounded in who you are as a person. Um, so I, I do work with with educators around mindfulness. And one of the things that is available for, for people to work with me on is is getting some individual coaching around um, how to, to start to find that inner voice yourself. I have a few coaching spots available. Um, I have another podcast too, actually. Can they find out about the Oh, where, the, where can they find about it? Oh, like, oh about thank that. you, Susan, for asking that. They can find out about it at, um, <laughs> just, just imagine it and it'll somehow it'll magically land in your yeah, lap. Just use um, your mindfulness. Yeah, just boom. Um, so I have a website that also is where our Awakening Educator website is, which is, um, or our Awakening Educator page, which is www.your, Y-O-U-R, uh, the number three, at EYES.com or www.your3eyes.com. And on there, you can actually learn a lot of different ways to work with me, my coaching, how to get in touch with me for coaching. I also have an online course on how to start to really support the the second eye, the insight part, which is learning how to um, understand what your beliefs are and how they're impacting you. Um, and uh, you can also read, I have some blogs on there. You can learn about my other podcast, which is really about supporting educators and, and anybody to attack to connect with their intuition. Um, so lots of exciting things. And we also have our Awakening Educator page on there, which has all of our previous shows listed and um, different ways that you can connect with us. I think it'd be great for folks to join our, our newsletter so that they can give us show topic ideas. We have a yeah. plan, but it'd be great to get a sense of, of folks that, um, of the content that our listeners want to hear about. 
um, and even suggest people for us to interview for themes that we have coming up. Because sometimes we have a theme, but don't always have the people that we want to speak to in that theme. So it'd be great to get uh, a national or international perspective on a lot of these issues that we think are so important. And it, I, I know that um, mindfulness has really been taken off and, and, and the, the benefits have been showing up in research and science and schools. And how is it that your three eyes looks Because it does feel a little bit different the way that you think about it as more incorporated into this more holistic perspective around how mindfulness fits into this, this larger framework. And how is that different than the way that mindfulness is usually thought of, which is seems as its own sort of capsulated thing? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, it came up this week a few times too, which is I think it with so much of the maybe I, I, I call them soft skills, but these these elements where they're really about us having a deepening our relationship with ourselves, our self-awareness, our emotional intelligence. It's often hard for people to see how those fit into the rest of our lives, but really they are they're just another lens or another way of seeing our lives. So if we start to learn to to integrate mindfulness into everything that we do, just being more grounded and present, more self-aware of how we're talking, communicating, it kind of automatically starts to roll out. Um, and you don't have to be so, I think people tend to segment things like this and you don't need to segment them. They're really all connected in. Um, so I'd love to talk with you more about that next time. Um, yeah. I, I did want to introduce something that we're going to be doing uh, every week uh, for the for the foreseeable future, um, which is we want to dedicate. Hopefully not too long. Hopefully not too long um, although I think the, the the fight will be a long one. Um, uh, we want to dedicate this show and all the remaining shows some of the time each show to the immigration um, policies that are happening, and specifically as as a show dedicated to educators and educators who serve children. Um, calling attention to um, the atrocities that are happening at the border, the separation of families and the treatment of children um, in the detention centers. And so we want to talk a little bit about, um, talk about that. We want to dedicate this show to the students and children that are in the detention centers now, but we also want to raise your awareness a little bit. We have some information on the website, but we also have some facts we wanted to share with you now. Um, Susan, do you want to share the first one? Sure. So this is according to NBC News, the cost of housing children in these tent cities, the concentration camps that we've been hearing about, the detention centers, uh, is $775 a day. One of the biggest contracts for the detention center is held by GEO, a major, and it's a, they're a major contributor to the Trump campaign. And according to GEO's own website, they expect a full year of 2019 total revenue to be approximately $2.47 billion. So this company is just making money off of the, uh, the treatment, uh, the inhumane treatment of our children. Thank you, Susan. And this is a quote from BuzzFeed. They said it's from a 16-year-old girl in the detention centers. She says, we're in a metal cage with 20 other teenagers, with babies and young children. We have one mat we need to share with each other. It is very cold. We each got a mylar blanket, but it is not enough to warm up. There are benches, but we cannot sleep there. Sometimes it is so crowded we cannot find a place to sleep, so they allow a few of us to sleep outside the fenced area. The lights are on all the time. So This is the way we're treating children who are separated from their families, um, and it's just absolutely unacceptable. We're we're already at time, Susan, um, but we uh, we wanted to let everybody know that um, we stand with the students and families. Um, this isn't a, a political issue necessarily. It's more about it's just not okay to separate families, especially families that are in crisis. We need to find another way, and um, we're going to continue to bring forward ideas and ways to to do just that. So, right. and we'll link you to some actions you can take uh, on our website. Absolutely. If you go to year three eyes dot com, the Awakening Educator tab, you'll find a link to a whole bunch of different ways that you can be involved yourself. Thank you, Susan. I miss you. I can't wait to be in studio with you next you, week. Megan. The new heart you taught me. So new heart. Yep. New heart. This is from Argos. Thank you, Argos. Um, so yes, I can't wait to see you next week. Class is dismissed. Wasn't that fun? Susan and Megan are always happy to greet you on the next episode of The Awakening Educator every other Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern. Watch all our shows anytime from anywhere in the world at uimediaapp.com. Connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Spreaker. 
at United Intentions to be up to date with the show. Have any questions you'd like to ask? Maybe you have knowledge you'd like to share. Email us at contact at unitedintentions.org and we will read your comments live on air. Education is the foundation for a brighter future. Open your eyes to the awakening educator only on the UI Media Network. The United Intentions Foundation and its associates take no responsibility for the opinions and statements made by the talk show host.